Well, good morning, everybody. So glad that you are with us this morning. Happy Father's Day to you dads out there, to all you father figures. So glad that you have joined us today and to celebrate what God did this last week uh, at camp with our youth. Amazing to have you guys up here leading us in worship. You all need to know that this past week at youth camp, we had over 30 students who trusted in Christ for their salvation. Yes. And over 30 students who said, I wanna publicly declare my faith through baptism. I mean, God was powerfully at work in the lives of these kids. And so we are so glad to get to celebrate that with you guys today. We are in the third week of our sermon series on the book of Titus. So if you have your Bible or you have it on your device, let's turn there to Titus chapter one. Titus chapter one. And I wanna begin this morning by simply asking you this question. What is the gospel? What is the gospel? How how would you answer the question, what is the gospel? I I taught a course for a number of years uh, to seminary students called evangelism, a course that was all about sharing the gospel. That word evangelism comes from the Greek word uh, euangelion that just means gospel or literally good news. And so if we're gonna have a class that's all about sharing the gospel, I would begin with that question, what is the gospel? And I would have them take a three by five card and kind of write their summary of the gospel. And it was really interesting. If I had 35 students in the room, I had 35 different versions of the gospel. And some of them were longer, some of them shorter, some of them overlapping or connecting, some of them a, a kind of memorized formula that they had learned along the way, but, but some sense of diversity in how to answer the question, what is the gospel, because it seemed to me that in a course that was all about sharing the gospel with other people, that that we ought to have a very clear sense of what the gospel is. And and not merely, as many of us, I think, grew up with in the church, what John Ortberg has called the minimum entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die, right? That, That sometimes we wind up with a kind of reductionistic version of the gospel that's merely the minimum entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die. And the thing is, is that the gospel, the good news about Jesus is so much more than merely the minimum entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die. In other words, the good news of Jesus is even better than many of us have been led to believe. You see, the gospel isn't just about what happens to you after you die. It's not just about saving your soul. It's about changing your life. That yes, the gospel does give us hope for all eternity, amen, thank you, God. But it also is about giving us here and now a sense of meaning and purpose and vision and direction and hope and healing and transformation. The good news of the gospel is better than we've been led to believe. And that if we're going to share the gospel, we need to know the gospel in all its fullness and depth and beauty. And if that's the case with regard to our sharing the gospel, to to know it, to understand it in all of its fullness and depth and beauty, so too it is the case that we need to know the gospel in all its fullness, depth, and beauty in order to recognize that which is not gospel. You see, friends, I believe that we live in a world that is filled with faux gospels. And I don't mean F-O-E, faux gospels, although that might be true, but F-A-U-X, like false gospels, pseudo gospels, fake gospels, that ultimately is not good news. And the only way that we spot the, the faux gospels, the pseudo gospels, is to really know the true gospel. In the book of Titus, Paul is writing to his young protege, Titus, who he has left behind on the island of Crete to oversee a network of house churches. And Paul, in the passage we're gonna look at this morning, is, is deeply concerned that Titus teach the true gospel because there are those in these churches on the island of Crete who are spreading faux gospels. And this morning, I wanna think about how we recognize and respond to the pseudo gospels, the faux gospels that surround us, but also to help us recognize and and more deeply understand and embrace the one true gospel. Look with me at Paul's words to Titus, beginning in chapter one, verse 10. For there are many rebellious people full of meaningless talk and deception, especially those of the circumcision group. They must be silenced because they are disrupting whole households 
by teaching things that they ought not teach, and that for the sake of dishonest gain. One of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. I'm just saying, right? (laughs) This saying is true, Paul says. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in their faith and will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands of those who reject the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciousness are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They're detestable and disobedient and unfit for doing anything good. Paul's words here are sharp. They're they're pointed. He's a little bit exercised because he's concerned about the ways in which faux gospels, pseudo gospels are finding their way into these churches on the island of Crete. His words to Titus here begin with the word for that simply points back to what he said previously. It points back to to chapter one, verse five, where Paul says, the reason that I left you there in Crete was that you might put in order what was in disorder, that you might finish what was incomplete and do that by appointing leaders. And so last week we talked about the importance of leadership in the local church and, and Paul's words commanding Titus to establish leaders over these house churches. Here he begins with pointing back and saying, the reason that I did that, the reason that I left you there, is first off he says there, were, there are rebellious people. Many rebellious people, and that word there is just simply without authority. That is those who are an authority unto themselves. And Paul writes and gives warning. He says, beware of those who are an authority unto themselves, who are not under the authority of God, under the authority of God's word. There, there are many rebellious people that he says, and, and he says that there are people who are filled with meaningless talk, that they might sound really good, but there's nothing of substance that they're saying. Sometimes I hear some of these TV preachers, and that's sort of an apt description, right? They, they sound really good, but there's no substance to what they're saying. Paul says they're rebellious people. They're full of meaningless talk and deception, And particularly down there at the end of verse 11, he says they're filled with deception for the sake of dishonest gain. That Paul is writing and saying some of these people who are spreading faux gospels, who are are perpetuating pseudo gospels, aren't just doing it out of naivete. They're actually doing it for their own twisted purposes, for their own dishonest gain. It's a good thing that wouldn't happen in our day, right? I remember early on in my ministry, one of my very first memories in ministry, I was serving as a youth pastor at a little church not that far from here. And, uh, and one of the first things that I was a part of, I gathered with a ministerial association, those folks in the community who were serving various churches, and we got together for a lunch. And the first subject of discussion at this gathering of local church leaders well, what we as churches were going to do in response to the many people that we found in our community that had come there to be a part of, to, to visit the ministry of one of these prosperity preachers whose ministry headquarters was right down the road. And what we found is that there were many who had um, leveraged everything they had just to be able to travel there to be a part of this ministry, and then everything they had left, they had given to that ministry, and then they found themselves with nothing, not even enough money that they could scrape together to get a bus ticket back home. And so we were talking about what, what are we as churches going to do to respond to this growing need of these people? Paul warns here about those who would spread deception for the sake of dishonest gain. But in particular, here Paul talks about the group of people that he sees as threatening to these churches on the island of Crete as what he calls part of the circumcision group. The circumcision group. He uses the same phrase back in Galatians 2 to talk about a similar group of people, the circumcision group, or sometimes translated circumcision party, but that sounds like a whole different thing, right? (laughs) Come on over. We're going to have a circumcision party. It's going to be fun. It's not that, right? When Paul uses this little phrase, circumcision group, he's talking about a group of people who are advocating Jesus plus obedience to the old covenant law. You see, circumcision was uh, uh, an expression, a, a sign of obedience to the old covenant community. It it, it was a, a symbol of your participation in that old covenant community. 
And so here are a group of teachers who are coming in to the churches who are advocating Jesus plus obedience to the law. And Paul is deeply concerned about anything that would be Jesus plus anything. You see, as, as has been very aptly said, Jesus plus anything is nothing. Jesus plus nothing is everything. The gospel isn't Jesus plus. The gospel is Jesus. And so what you have here is essentially a kind of self-help version of the gospel. It is a gospel that says your ability to, to, be, to be saved is in your own hands. You save yourself by your obedience, by your own strength, by your own power, by your own might. And this, friends, is where I think there are all kinds of faux gospels in our world today, where our ability to be saved, to be healed, to be transformed is our own power, our own strength, our own ability. And any version of good news that puts your status, your salvation, your healing, your transformation in your own power, in your own strength, in your own hands, is a faux gospel, a pseudo gospel. It's not good news. And Paul will later here in the passage talk about it as merely human commands. Look what he says beginning in verse 12. One of Cretan's own prophets has said it. Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, and lazy gluttons. Just saying. This saying is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply so that they will be sound in their faith, And will pay no attention to Jewish myths or to merely human commands of those who reject the truth. Now, I keep being playful about this statement where Paul says, uh, he quotes Epimenides, the philosopher, all Cretans are liars. And the reason I keep emphasizing kind of the playfulness here is that I think Paul is in fact being playful, that, that this is what is referred to as the Epimenides paradox. Epimenides, a Cretan, says all Cretans are liars. Right? Epimenides essentially says, you can't believe anything that a Cretan says, said the Cretan. Right? There, there's an, an essential paradox here that Paul is highlighting. But what he's doing in, in appealing to these words from Epimenides is talking about the reality that Cretan culture is notorious for deception. It's not considered a, a vice, but a, a kind of virtue. And so what Paul is highlighting here once again is the way in which the churches on the island of Crete, the, the concern that he has, that they would look more Cretan than Christian, that they would look more Crete-like than Christ-like. And this, friends, is why I think this letter for us is so important and so timely, that we must always be attentive to, aware of, and, and, and careful about the ways in which our complicated culture that surrounds us would find its way into the way in which we do Christianity, the way in which we do church, the way in which we understand the gospel. And so Paul warns them about this kind of creep and about this emphasis on merely human commands. Once again, an emphasis on Jesus plus obedience to the law. And then he says in verse 15, to the pure... All things are pure, but to those who are corrupted and do not believe, nothing is pure. In fact, both their minds and their consciousness are corrupted. They claim to know God, but by their actions, they deny him. They are detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything good. And then I think we have a very unfortunate chapter break. You see, because I think Paul's thought actually continues into chapter two, verse one. He says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate for sound doctrine. That, that Paul concludes this thought unit by saying that there are these who are rebellious, who are, who are disobedient, who are full of meaningless talk, but you've got to teach what's useful for sound doctrine. You've got to teach the truth. But, but we need to pause and just look at this little line. To the pure, all things are pure. What, what is Paul getting at here? I think what Paul is after is he's saying the pseudo-gospels say that we have an outside-in problem. That what we do on the outside determines if we're pure on the inside. But the true gospel says that we've got an inside-out problem. 
If we're impure on the inside, nothing from the outside can change us. Nothing from the outside can save us. Nothing from the outside can purify us. But the gospel is the good news that God changes us from the inside out. That he's the one who purifies our hearts and our consciences. It's not that we have an outside in problem, it's that we have an inside out problem, but God has given us an inside out solution. And he says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. You, he says, must teach the true gospel. And what is the true gospel then? I wanna spend the remainder of the time that we have thinking about the nature of the true gospel, the beyond merely the minimum entrance requirements to get into heaven when you die. The good news of the gospel is even better than many of us have been led to believe. And uh, I love the way that the late Tim Keller talked about three different aspects of the gospel, what he calls the historical aspect, the sonship aspect, and the kingdom aspect. The historical aspect, the sonship aspect, and the kingdom aspect. And the historical aspect is simply the reality of what God has done what God has done through Jesus, what God has done in history through Jesus. And the good news of the gospel is not uh, just merely good advice to be lived up to, it is good news to be lived into. It is not good advice that we achieve, it is good news that we receive. Good news of what God has done for us in history through Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul provides there a little kind of nutshell summary of the gospel, and he says this. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. And after that, he appeared to more than 500 of our brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Paul here provides this little summary of the historical aspect of the gospel, what God has done in Christ historically. And it's important when you're studying the Bible to look at the verbs and to to note the verbs that are used here about what God has done through Christ, what happened to Jesus. And Paul begins by saying, Christ died. This is historical fact, Christ died, that that he was killed upon a cross, that, that he experienced a violent death, but he says more than merely the historical fact. He said, Christ died for our sins. Historical fact, theological meaning. That when Jesus hung on the cross, that he bore the guilt and shame of the world. And when Jesus hung on the cross, he bore the guilt and shame of you. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. That Paul is saying there, this was not merely an accident of history, that, that this is not merely some grave injustice. While it is that, it is more than that. This is the culmination, the climax of the story that God has been writing from the beginning. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then Paul says, and he was buried. And I think his emphasis on Christ's burial is just a way of saying he was really dead, right? He died and he was really dead. So dead they buried him, right? Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he was raised. Paul says that that he was raised to new life according to the scriptures. That Christ who subjected himself to sin and death bore our guilt and shame upon the cross, triumphed over guilt and shame through his resurrection, that he is victorious over sin and death, and he has won victory for us over sin and death. And and this is, according to the scriptures, this is the story that God has been writing all along. Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried and then he was raised to new life, according to the scriptures. And then he appeared. And then Paul will talk about the people that he appeared to, but part of what Paul is doing here, just as when he says he was buried is a way of saying he was really dead, so too when he says he appeared is a way of saying he was really alive. He appeared to people, and you can go talk to them. This is historic, verifiable, fact, reality, something that happened in history. Christ is bodily risen from the dead. 
You see, when Jesus died on Friday, all of his earliest followers, all of his closest friends completely abandoned hope that all their sense that that this might be the one who was to be the Messiah, all of that was gone. Their hopes were dashed until they saw him. And then they were filled with this confident conviction that they had seen him, that he had been raised from the dead. And it's because of that that they went and they proclaimed the good news even to the point that they themselves were violently killed. Who would do that for something that they knew wasn't true, but they knew it was true because they saw him alive. And that the bedrock of Christian faith is a historic reality of the resurrection of Jesus. In fact, we don't believe the resurrection of Jesus because we believe the Bible. We believe the Bible because of the resurrection of Jesus. A historical reality that Christ is raised from the dead that gives us confidence of the truth that God has made himself known to us through Jesus. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. and He was raised again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And he appeared. This is the historical reality. And when you think about every faux gospel out there, when you think about every other religion, that all of them are about what we live up to, advice that we live up to, that th- those founders may have done great things. They may have had great teaching. They may, they may have done miracles according to those stories. And yet ultimately, in, in every other religion, it is not about what that founder has done. It is about what we must do to live up to. But the good news of Jesus is precisely the opposite. It's not about what we do. It's about what he has done. The historical aspect of the gospel, second, is what Keller calls the sonship aspect of the gospel. That is the idea that because of what Christ has done, Christ, God's unique son, makes possible all of us to become sons and daughters with a secure identity in him. The apostle John in 1 John writes, behold what manner of love the father has given to us that we might be called children of God. And that is what we are. This aspect of the gospel underscores the idea that it's not about some future status that we achieve, but a current status that we receive. Not some future status that we hope for, some current status that we experience now. Jesus, in the gospel of John, John chapter five, verse 24, Jesus says to those who are listening to him, very truly I tell you, Whoever hears these words of mine and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Jesus is talking about eternal life begins now. Whoever hears these words of mine and believes, that is trust in, we've talked about this idea that it's more than merely mental assent, it is really trust in, reliant on. Whoever hears these words of mine and believes in him who sent me has eternal life, not will have, not might have, has eternal life. Whoever believes these words of mine and and hears these words of mine, believes in him who sent me, has crossed over from death to life. Not will cross over, not might cross over, but has crossed over. Eternal life begins now. The life of the age to come that has come into our lives here and now that happens to continue on forever. But the offer that Jesus makes to us is eternal life that begins now. Not a hope for achievement in the future, but a secure status that is ours now. The, most, the, the thing that is most deeply true of you is you are a beloved child of God and you can live from that secure status by trusting in the good news of the gospel. The historical aspect of the gospel, the sonship aspect of the gospel, and then finally the kingdom aspect of the gospel. And this is interesting. This was when I did that exercise with the three by five cards with my students. This was the aspect of the gospel that got the least consideration, the least mention. And that's fascinating because when you look at the apostle Paul and all of his writings in the New Testament, what you find is that Paul often emphasizes justification by faith, our being set right with God on the basis of faith. But when you see Jesus talk about the gospel, 
Jesus most often talks about the kingdom of God. And these two things are not in contradiction to one another. They're not in conflict with each other. They both belong together. In fact, you think about the words that we talked about earlier from 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, who died for our sins and rose from the dead? It says, Christ died for our sins and rose from the dead. And we're so accustomed to seeing that word Christ in the pages of our New Testament and just thinking that's kind of a stand-in for Jesus' name. As though Christ, sometimes we treat it like it's Jesus' last name. But the word Christ is not a name, it's a title. And as we've talked about before, it's a title that literally means anointed one, right? The one who is anointed to become king. And in the Old Testament imagination, that one who is anointed to become king would be the one who would come and liberate God's people, set God's people free. That I think we would be helped in our reading of the New Testament if every time we saw the word Christ, We would hear it as the liberating king. The liberating king died for our sins, was buried, and rose again and appeared. That means that that there's a whole backstory to this little summary of the gospel. This is about a king and a kingdom who's come to set his people free and come to set the world to rights. He's come to, to, to bring his, what is sometimes referred to as upside down kingdom. Because the the kingdom that Jesus comes to bring, the the kingdom that Jesus constantly talks about, is upside down according to the world's standards. Now, I think it's important that we recognize that what Jesus comes to bring when he comes talking about the kingdom is actually turning the world right side up. And yet it defies all expectations of the way the world operates, both in terms of how it is achieved and how it is received. The kingdom of God comes through Jesus, the king enthroned upon a cross. The way of the world is the king comes riding on the horse victorious through violence. The gospel is that Jesus, our king, subjected himself to a violent death. The king enthroned upon a cross, turning the expectations of the world upside down. But not only is this gospel achieved in an upside down way, but it's also received in an upside down way that it is, it is received merely by trusting that it is true. It is, it is received not by the way the world operates because the way the world operates is what you give in order to get entry, right? You bring something of value in exchange for entry and anywhere you go in the world, you've got to offer something of value in exchange for the ability to enter in and that's not the way the kingdom operates, that we have nothing to commend ourselves to gain entry. Jesus, in the first of his Beatitudes, says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize that they are spiritually bankrupt, that they have nothing in themselves to commend themselves to God. It's those kind of people, Jesus says, to whom the kingdom belongs. I love the way the old hymn captures this. Nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Jesus, or I die. Nothing in my hands I bring. When, when Jesus first opens his mouth and we see the first words of Christ in red in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter one, verse 14 to 15, Mark writes, at that time, John was put into prison and Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news, proclaiming the gospel. And this is what he said. The time has come. The kingdom of God, the reign of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. That word repent, the Greek word is metanoia, to to change one's mind, but the Hebrew concept is to, to turn Right? To turn from where you've been going and what you've been doing and what you've been trusting in and giving your loyalty and allegiance to. To turn from that and to trust in Jesus. To give him your loyalty and allegiance. To repent and believe. To trust the good news. And that you can experience the upside down kingdom, the, the reign of God in your hearts and lives now by repenting and believing this good news. And so friends, my question to you today is what are you trusting to save you? 
What are you trusting to save you? And I don't just mean what are you trusting to save you for eternity, what you're trusting to save you after you die. I mean, what are you trusting to save you right now? What are you trusting to save your marriage? What are you trusting to save you from anxiety, from anger, from despair, from shame? Friends, can I just tell you that if you're trusting anything to save you that puts the responsibility in your own hands as though your salvation is somehow your own accomplishment, your your own ability, that you're trusting in a faux gospel, that ultimately Jesus is the one who saves us both for eternity and for now. As we trust in the historical aspect of the gospel, what God has done for us in Christ, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and was raised again in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared. And that this good news is not good advice that we live up to, it's good news that we receive and live into. And that we receive the reality of our beloved status as children of God, sons and daughters of God, And this is not a status that we hope to achieve. It's a status that we definitively receive when we trust in Christ. And that we can enter into the upside down kingdom of God here and now by grace through faith. What are you trusting to save you right now? Let's pray together. And Father, I pray in these moments of response that you might move in our hearts or move across this room, drawing us to trust in you. God, for some to trust in you for the very first time today, to say, I wanna trust in what Jesus has done for me. I want to receive the status as God's beloved child. I want to enter into the kingdom of God, the reign of God here and now in my life, merely by trusting and what God has done through Christ. And God, for some of us, we're trusting in other things or we're trusting in ourselves to save us, not only for the future, but for the here and now. And Lord, we need to come to you and recognize that that while there may be things in this life that help us, nothing can save us but you. And we would trust you in a new and deeper way today and ask you to move in power in our lives. So Lord, move across this room today as we respond together to you. We pray it in Jesus' name, amen.